Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Tom Zook's U.S. Civil War Letters, 1862-1863, Part 3. Camp near Memphis, Tennessee, November 30th, 1862. Dear Wife and Daughter, Letter writing, especially to the dear ones at home, has always been to me a pleasure and considered a duty. But since we have been moving so rapidly, it has been next to impossible to get suitable opportunities to write at all. I mailed a letter to you from Cairo on Monday last, and since then we have not had time to do anything for ourselves. We arrived in Memphis on Thursday, having been just one week on the boat, and a tiresome week it was for me. For we had to sleep on the lower deck, and as there was three companies of us on the one deck, you can form some idea of how closely we were packed. But you must not think that we were compelled to remain below decks all the time. The only place we were excluded from was the cap, the cabin, and that was occupied by, quote, shoulder strappers exclusively. When we passed through the city, it was so dark that I could not see much of the sights. But one thing I did notice, and that was that We did not receive the same welcome by the inhabitants that we have in some other places as we pass through. In fact, I came fully to the conclusion that this is a thoroughly secesh community. We are now encamped about a mile and a half south or back of the city, for the river just in front of Memphis runs east and west, and we occupy the ground that has been used for camping purposes by both friend and foe alternately ever since the rebellion broke out. Just to the east of us is a cemetery that is said to be, by those who have seen it, one of the most superb they ever laid eyes on. Some of the monuments must have cost thousands. The country round about Memphis is very thickly settled as far as we have had a chance to see it. The land on which we are encamped is all laid out in town lots. About every fifth or sixth one is occupied. It is an absolute shame the way property has been destroyed by the Union troops that have been encamped in this place. There is a house just east of this camp about the size of Uncle Tom's that was formerly occupied by a rebel who deserted it when the Union forces occupied this place. I had occasion to go into it the other day, and it almost made me ashamed of the Union army when I looked at the ruthless and wanton destruction of the inside work of the building. Doors were torn from the hinges and either burned or carried off. Mantelpieces ripped loose from the chimneys and gone entirely. Windows torn from the frames and real kicked up generally. For my part, if I was the owner of the property, I would almost as leave they would have built fires in the center of every room in the house and gone off and left it to its fate. But such is war, and these are only a small part of the terrors and devastation that is going on wherever there is an army in camp. In the city of Memphis alone, the provost guard and rebel scalawags have burned many valuable business houses and dwellings. I noticed many fine-looking structures, of which there was nothing but the bare walls remaining, and these may be seen in every square, and sometimes two or three in succession. It is useless to enumerate. The only way one can form a just conception of the horrors of war is to view it oneself. Since we have got into camp again, our company organizations are once more perfect. The old adjutant adjutant has returned to his place, and John Williams has come back to the company now. Marsh Godman is once more orderly, and things move as they did at first. Well, Davis has got back to his company again and is no longer the colonel's clerk. You said in your last letter that I ought to write to Frank. I have written to him and and Charlie, but could never hear whether any letters reached them or not. I shall write again soon, hoping to receive an answer. If I persevere, nothing would suit me better than to hear from the boys, especially while they are both sick. Now about those thimbles at Bowen's. I do not fully remember after so long a time exactly where I did take them to, but the circumstances are somewhat as follows. I took the pipe to John Williams' shop and had it cut in two so that the thimbles would come off. And if I remember right, I then returned the thimbles to Bowen's shop. If they can't be found, I am indeed very sorry. I can't say more in my present circumstances. 
If I were at home, I think I could find them. You asked if I were comfortably fixed for clothing. Yes, I have plenty of good clothes. I have drawn a good dress coat, a good pair of light blue pants, two good woolen shirts, and two pairs of drawers, cotton flannel, a good pair of sewed shoes, blanket, overcoat, and in fact everything necessary. I would like to have a comforter, but if we have to march, I can't carry it. I have that vest yet that I bought from home with me. I have my blouse and four pair of socks, two pair that mother sent me and those blue ones that I wore away, and one pair of governments. We all are well supplied with good clothes, so you need have no anxiety on that point. The weather here now is about like May and June in Ohio. We sleep on the ground under one blanket, and in the daytime it it requires but a little exertion to raise a sweat. I would like to work here if the war was over, as they pay from three to four dollars per day and cash. Some of the boys say they are coming down when they get out of the army. Jim Lefevre was ordered under arrest today. You did not appear to know by your letter of his deviltry. He was sent to Marion, Ohio, by the officers in charge of the body and furnished with ninety dollars to defray expenses. Instead of proceeding to Marion at once, he took the body to Louisville and had it interned, interred, and then went home and told the friends of the boy that he could not raise money enough in the regiment to pay expenses. It is reported that he got about thirty-six dollars out of the boy's uncle as expenses. Now he has impudence enough to come back and say he is an injured and abused man, but his military career is about ended. The probability is that he will be disgraced and sent home minus his pay. You must not make this public, for it might make trouble. You say that Nettie is beginning to be considerable of a girl. Dear Anna, that is just what worries me most, not to hear you tell of her pranks, but to think I must be away from home and her just at the time when I should be there to enjoy her childish prattle and baby fancies. For you know that now is one of the most interesting periods of her young existence. But stern fate decrees that such shall be my condition at present. Did you get my bounty money yet? I would like to know. Did you get that order I sent you? If so, tell me in your next letter. I have not received any letters from anyone but you since I left Camp Bates. And that was the 8th day of October. If they write, I never get them. I don't know now when we will get our pay from the government, but do not expect till the 25th of December, as that will be our next payday. You may look for it as soon as I receive it, if I have any possible chance to send it. We do not expect to stay here long, but expect to go further down the river, unless they should make us provost guard of the city of Memphis for this winter. There has been about 40,000 troops marched from this point within a week, and more are constantly arriving. I have made this of sufficient length and will stop for the present. Kiss my little girl for me, and remember that my dear Anna is ever in my thoughts. Goodbye, your affectionate Tom. Camp Elmwood, Tennessee, December 14, 1862. Dearest Anna and little daughter, Since last writing, our camp has been christened, as you will observe by the heading, but the naming of the camp of the 96 is always the precursor of an order for a move, and therefore we come to the conclusion that there is a a change just ahead of some kind or other. General Sherman's division arrived in Memphis from Holy Springs yesterday, and it is said that, that they are to proceed immediately towards Vicksburg, Mississippi, or as soon as they can get transportation and our brigade and another that is here with us is to accompany them. After we get together, we are to form the right wing of the expedition with General Sherman, and General Grant's army is to move from some other point in the interior and form the center, and the left is to be supplied by General Rosencrans, who will move in from the east east of Grant. The whole, when combined, to form the, the grand expedition against the rebel stronghold, Vicksburg. But the prevailing opinion is that the enemy dare not meet us and will evacuate. But this information I have got from a source that may not be altogether reliable. 
Charlie King has just come into our camp, and I had quite a little talk with him. He says that he belongs to the 54th OBI and is in General Sherman's brigade. They expect to go down the Mississippi River in three or four days. He has seen some pretty hard service, but looks well. They have been lately down in Mississippi with General Grant's army. Jim Lefevre has resigned and intends to go home in a few days. He kindly offered to take anything to Marion, Ohio for me that I might wish to send. Company E held an election the other day to supply the places made vacant by the resignations of Lefevre and Van Fleet, which resulted in the choice of Bolentine Laffam for first lieutenant and Mr. Williams Coulter for second lieutenant. The company seemed to feel satisfied that they have now got men suitable to fill the places they will soon occupy, and I hope they may not again be disappointed. Now, as I have written all the news, I hardly know what to write that will be interesting to you. The weather for a few days has been warm and sultry, in fact so warm that we can very well dispense with our blankets after night. The flies are now so thick in our tent that they are becoming bothersome while I try to write. Charlie King tells me that when we get back into the interior, away from the influence of the river, that the weather is still warmer and it puzzles me to think what kind of summer they must have down here, when December weather is so warm. We have had quite a number of cases of measles in the regiment within the last ten days, and it is a great source of gratification to me to know that I have had them. I had three letters from Marysville, Ohio this week, one from your pa and one from Noni and Emma each. They tell me that you intend going back to Marysville soon. I want you as... As soon as you do, get back to write me, so I will know how to send my letters. But I don't know what to do. Sometimes about our mails, I feel almost like sitting down and crying over the matter if that would do any good. We never get any, or at least I don't, mail matter from Marion, Ohio, only what we get by someone who happens to be passing back and forth. The only letters I have had from you for a long time was the one that Eleonora brought and the one that Lefevre brought so you can judge of the awful sense of loneliness that sometimes comes over me but there is no use in worrying we can't make the circumstances any better but if we only patiently wait there is a better future for us we all have our trials and troubles in this life and the great leader of all that is good has promised not to afflict us above what we can bear Now for my little girl. What shall I say for my little daughter? I can see her in imagination toddling about and innocently prattling and running herself into all kinds of mischief. Oh, if I could only see her, it appears that I could be much more contented. But I have the consolation that I am in the path of duty. And if we only succeed in sustaining this glorious government and our free institutions... It will be a heritage that will be of more real value to our children than anything else we could possibly leave them. When you write to me again, tell me, if you can, the opinion of the folks up there in regard to the war, whether they think it will continue any length of time, or whether it will shortly cease. This is the intelligence anxiously sought after by all of the soldiers. The only news we get is from the Memphis, Tennessee newspapers, and they are generally unreliable and get get most of their intelligence from the Chicago and St. Louis newspapers. If we move in a day or two, I will write you again. I have just about run out of stamps and have to write to Frank and Charlie and the folks in Marysville. Dear Anna, pray that I may have firmness and strength enough to do right and be a good man. I want to do what is right. I I owe it to my wife and child at home, but I must stop and say goodbye. Ever yours affectionately, Tom. On on board the Hiawatha Steamship, December 20th, 1862. My own dear Anna, it is under peculiar circumstances that I attempt to write you a few lines this evening. We have just come on board the steamer and expect to move off in the direction of Vicksburg as soon as circumstances will permit in the morning. I would have written to you during the week, but it was reported in camp that no mail would be permitted to ascend the river for a week or more, 
and therefore I have not done so. Times in camp for the last few days have passed off as usual, nothing of particular note having occurred since I last wrote to you. Yes, there was one thing occurred that might be of some interest. Our captains got together one day during the week and got up a petition and sent it to Old Vance, our colonel, requesting him to resign, and you may be assured that he got on one of his big mad fits and ordered them all under arrest. But it ended, as such things usually do, in the forgiving of all offenders in the morning. But the scenes of a soldier's life are varied and present humanity in all its varied forms. Just at my left hand sits poor Wash Montgomery, a brother of John Haynes' wife, weeping bitterly over a letter that has just brought the intelligence that his sister, Mrs. Hain, is no more. Poor fellow! I feel for him, but can do nothing to allay his anguish. Just to my left is a party of boisterous over a game of cards, little caring how how bad maybe the news a comrade may receive and apparently caring as little for anything else that may happen to turn up. It is reported here this evening that Vicksburg has been evacuated by the rebels, and I pray God that it may be so, for it will save us a hard campaign and perhaps a battle or two. It is also reported that Richmond, Virginia is in the hands of federal forces. If this proved to be true, it is the death knell of the Southern Confederacy, and you may look for us home before long. They are making huge preparations for the reopening of the Mississippi River, and I think nothing human can prevent it this time. If there is any virtue in numbers and big guns and invulnerable gunboats, I can't tell how many men is going down the river with us, but judging from appearances, I should think that there is 75,000 or 100,000 besides the force that will operate from below. But I will be compelled to stop writing, for the boys are getting noisy and crowding me on all sides. Marsh Godman is to be my bedfellow tonight and wants to get down. I will write at every opportunity. Kiss my little girl for me. Pray for God's protection on poor unworthy me. From your ever affectionate Tom. This is a letter from uh, uh, from Tom's. Uh, I believe his a letter from Tom to Tom Zook from his sister Maria Zook, Marion, Ohio, December twenty first, eighteen sixty two. Dear brother, we took a letter from the office yesterday from you to Anna, and as she had gone home, we thought we would open it and see what you had to say, for we were very anxious to hear from you. And as you complained of not hearing from home, I thought I would write you again. I wrote you once before when you was in Kentucky, but suppose you never received it. And when Anna was here, we thought that she kept you posted on Marion matters. The folks at home are all well. Lena is teaching out at Carey's Station. Libby is visiting out at Scott Town at Gray's. Anna went home a week ago last Friday. She went in the hack to Delaware, Ohio, and intended staying all night there with Miss, Mr. Webster, the minister. I expect she would get to see Lou Starley as she is at Nellie's. She seemed very anxious to see her, having heard so much about her. We knew your letter could not be sent to her until tomorrow, so we thought we might as well see it, and then write one to Anna and send them both together, for we would have to pay postage on yours anyhow if we sent it on, or if we did not, Anna would. We miss Nettie a great deal. She is a great deal of company now. I expect Noni and Emma will have great times with her. Aunt Fanny, Travis, and Eleanor were here visiting a week or two ago. They say that John is lieutenant now and was at the time filling the captain's place. There has been a battle at Fredericksburg. Cal Godman came home from a visit to the, to the 4th on the 12th. That is a week ago Friday, and they were fighting then. On Sunday evening following, he got word that his father was severely wounded, and he and his mother took took the hand car and what and, and went to Galleon that night to take the first train and go after him. They are now in Washington with him and expect to bring him home as soon as he is able. Henry Clay had a dispatch yesterday afternoon that he was getting better. John Pritchard was slightly wounded. 
The rebels were making preparations to surround our men there, but on Monday they had a very favorable day, for it was very foggy, and they managed to cross the river, and I believe remove the bridges before they were aware anything was up, and so played sharp on the rebels. The, fo the fourth and eighth were both engaged. I suppose there were very few Marion, Ohio boys in it, for there were only four or five in Company P, and very few in Company H. I heard that Will Garrett had resigned and is on, is on his way home, but do not know how true it is. Mrs. Cooper died about two weeks ago. The children took it very hard. I suppose Anna will still keep house for the boys. John Haynes' wife was buried last Friday. She died of typhoid fever. He had just got over it when she took it. He is going to take the babe to his sister and break, break up. He is worse off than those that left their families to go into the army, for they have a hope of living together again. He has lost a prize, for I think there are a few better than her. I heard a few weeks ago that J. Jacoby had been exchanged and had been put in as a lieutenant, I believe. I had a letter from Mary Hardy about two weeks ago. They have sold their house and are living on Town Street in one of the eight buildings that are keeping boarders. Jane expects to go to Shelby in the spring with Mrs. Bright. She is going in a fancy store there. Uncle Joseph was here last night and today to quarterly meeting. He is very hearty and they are all well, but Melinda, who has been sick for some time. Grandfather Zook has been quite sick, but is better again. Nelson's folks were, were all well the last we heard from him. He had been... He had been sick but was about well again. Morty's leg is all healed over and she, she would be well enough if it was only straight but there is some hope she will outgrow that. Grandmother sends her love to you. Mother says she wants you to write as often as you can to us if it is only to send a note when someone else writes. The rest of the folks send their love. Write to us soon. Your sister Maria. Now here's a letter from Tom Zook's father, Marion, Ohio, December 22, 1862. Dear son, I thought I would write a few lines to you to let you know that I had not forgotten you. For I remember you often every day, and my prayers shall ever be for you, that you may give your heart to God with your affections, that he may protect and keep you from all harm, that you may return in peace and safety to friends and loved ones at home. You wish to know what people think of the war or the end of the war. There is no light in that direction as yet. Saturday the 13th, General Burnside made an attack, but the rebel works were too strong for him. We must still wait and see. We have had plenty of work in our shop for, for one and sometimes two hands since you left. The prospect for the coming year is good. The cost, the cost of living is about 50% higher than it was last year. Pork is low, $3.50. Flour, $6. Other things high. I wish you were at home and all the boys. Write when you can and let, let us know how you are. From your father. Fort Hindeman, Arkansas. January 13, 1863. My own dear Anna. It has been a long time since I have written to you, but it has not been because I have not had the will to do so, but because I could not have sent even the scratch of a pen if I had written a thousand letters. We have had but one mail go up the river from our expedition since we left Memphis, and then I made calculations of sending you a good long letter, but after sitting down and writing a hurried answer to Maria's last letter, Williams came to us and told us that we would have to mail what letters we had written, for the mail would leave immediately. So you can understand why I did not write that time. Well, after leaving Memphis, this fleet, consisting of 77 transport boats and five or six gunboats, together with some dispatch propellers, proceeded slowly down the river, occasionally stopping to destroy the buildings about the landings along the shore that had been used as rebel harbors. On Christmas, the 25th, we landed at a place known as Milliken's Bend, where our brigade landed and proceeded about 26 miles into Louisiana, 
and destroyed the railroad running from Vicksburg West. This march used up the men the worst way of any march we ever made yet. The whole thing was done inside of 36 hours. Well, on the 27th we run down the river and up the bayou to within 12 miles of the rear of Vicksburg. The army immediately disembarked and moved through the swamps to the rebel works, which they found about seven miles from the landing. This was Saturday night, and therefore nothing was done until next morning, for you know our army always does the principal part of their fighting on Sunday. So so they did not make the attack until next morning when a brisk cannonade was commenced by both parties, but nothing of importance was accomplished this day. The rebel works being too strong and so situated that it would be impossible to take them any other way than by storm. And then there was quite a stream to ford in doing so, and the rebel works were on the top of some high bluffs that it would be next to impossible to scale. And our forces were in a most detestable swamp. The next day, Monday, the fight was resumed with about the same success as the day before, with the exception that some regiments on the left tried to storm some of the Sesesh works, but were repulsed with considerable loss. The third day, the same thing was repeated by the right wing with about the same success. And so the thing continued until New Year's night, when the whole army quietly retreated to the boats and re-embarked, having lost, in lost, killed, and wounded about 500, and one regiment taken prisoners. Besides, about one-third of the army was unfitted for duties by diarrhea and fevers that were contracted in that abominable swamp, and many of them died afterwards, one company of our regiment having lost as many as five men by fever. Our company lost one. His name was DeVolt, and he, he came from Mount Gilead, Ohio. After leaving, we moved up up to the mouth of the Yazoo River, where we lay around for a day or two, waiting for something. Here it rained and stormed for a day or two, and as our company was on the hurricane deck of the boat, we had it pretty rough. On the 8th, we arrived at the mouth of White River, and on the 9th, proceeded up the same for some distance when we passed through a bayou into the Arkansas River, and landed within about three miles of this place on the 10th. The next day we landed about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and proceeded up to the first line of rebel rifle pits, but they were already abandoned, the rebs having been scared by the appearance of our gunboats, which could easily reach them from the river. We passed over these and marched through mud and dirt for about a mile further where we lay down on the damp ground and tried to sleep till the next morning. We were up the next morning at daybreak, this was Sunday the 11th, and about at about 8 o'clock moved around to our position on the left of the line and lay down on our faces, waiting for something to be done. It was not long until the 17th Ohio Battery, which was stationed right in front of our company, opened on them, and then it was that the canister and shell began to rattle thick all around us, and if ever I lay close to the ground I'd done it then, for the boys were being struck all around me. Some badly wounded, some killed outright, and others slightly wounded. How many were hurt we, while we lay there, I cannot tell. About two o'clock, we were ordered up, up the rebel batteries, been nearly silenced by the gunboats and the land batteries. We charged right down across an open field right in front of the fort until we come, came within about 75 yards of the breastworks and under one of the most murderous fires of musketry, the officers say, that was, that was ever seen. Why we were not all killed in this charge, I cannot imagine. Here we lay on our faces again and loaded and fired as often as we knew how. Our officers and men displaying unparalleled bravery, cheering and yelling all the time. But I will have to wait to tell you about this when we get home, for I cannot explain it on paper. At four o'clock, the Rebs raised the white flag, and then the boys went in, clambering over the breastworks and cheering like madmen, which did not cease until sundown. The result of the victory is about 6,000 prisoners with their arms and accoutrements, besides several batteries of fine guns. The guns in the fort proper were entirely destroyed by our artillery. There were six of them, three siege and three rifle parrot guns. 
The rebel works here outside of the main fort are about three quarters of a mile long and were bravely defended before they surrendered. But it was of no use. They had to succumb to superior force and generalship. The lost in this battle about 500 killed and wounded. The rebel loss is about 150. The reason of the difference is on account of them being in the fortifications. Yesterday I passed over the battleground and the horrors that I seen cannot be described. No way. Our regiment went into the battle with 330 men and lost 25 wounded and 10 killed. There was none killed from our company and but six wounded. I would give you their names, but you would not know them. Company E had one man killed. His name was Matthew Bent, shot through the head with a musket ball. He lived east of Marion, Ohio, and was married and had one child. But for my part, I was mercifully shielded and protected by a kind providence, so that, so that not even a thread on my clothing was broken, th- was broken, although I expected never to get through the day alive. Dear wife, write with me in, in return, in returning thanks for so great and merciful protection. But I am making this too long as I want to send you some little mementos of the fight. I will have to stop or I will make the letter too heavy. Enclosed find two pieces of flag stuff. One is from the flag on one side of the fort and the other is from the garrison flag at which we aimed all of our ninth shots. The blue piece was from the garrison flag. This flag was presented to the Texas Brigade by the ladies of Texas and is a splendid piece of workmanship. It was torn down by a member of the 48th OBI who kindly gave me a piece, but is now in the hands of our commanding general. The other red piece is from a flag that I have not learned the history, but you must be sure and save them. This paper that I am writing on I took from the trunk of a Reb officer that was knocked to pieces by a cannon shot, the trunk, I mean, and cost him $12 to acquire. I also picked up some letters from the same trunk, one of which I will send you in this, but I am afraid it will make it too heavy. But I must stop, for the lieutenant is waiting to mail this. I will write write soon again. Write to me as often as possible. Perhaps some of your letters may reach me sometime. I have got but one letter from Marion or Marysville from, from a whole month or ever since we left Memphis. Kiss my little Nettie for me. I am thinking of her and her ma almost every hour of the day. But I must say goodbye. Your ever affectionate Tom. Well, that concludes today's presentation. We'll continue next time with part four of Tom Zook's Civil War Letters. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.